Welcome to The Property Perspective, a podcast by Knight Frank Australia. We'll share expert analysis from industry leaders, focus on key trends and forecasts, and bring you the latest topics shaping Australia's property market. Hi, thank you for joining us for the latest episode of Property Perspective by Knight Frank Australia. My name is Neil Brooks, Global Head of Capital Markets for Knight Frank. And today I'm joined by Justin Bond and Ben Burston, who will be discussing the current outlook on capital markets with a focus on investor sentiment and the impact on global economy. Justin and Ben, if you could please introduce yourselves. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Uh, my name's Justin Bond. I'm the Head of Capital Markets for Knight Frank Australia. Sure. I'm Ben Burston. I'm the Chief Economist and Head of Research at Knight Frank. Uh, welcome. So, Ben, first to you. Uh, after a very testing time for the global economy, are we seeing signs of improvement, do you think, over the next 12 to 24 months? I think we are. I think we've seen some important signs of improvement over the past few months, actually. I mean, if we compare to this time a year ago, I think in Australia and around the world, there was a feeling of uncertainty in that we were, we'd started on the journey towards higher interest rates. Um, inflation was still quite high, and we've lagged that process somewhat in Australia, but um, and, and then on top of that, there was a the feeling that the interest rate increases that were required were really presenting big downside risks to growth. And I think um, over the past, well, really over the past year, what we've seen is is that all of economies have probably withstood that a bit better than expected. That's not to say that there haven't been um, you know, a big slowdown in growth, and we've probably seen that more in more, more in Europe uh, than other than, than in the US and Asia. But generally, um, economies have been able to withstand that better. Uh, and so obviously that's positive. Labor markets have remained really tight. Unemployment rates have r- remain low, uh, contrasting with expectations that they would rise more quickly. Um, consumers have been under pressure, but um, again, on the whole, they probably withstood those big increases in mortgage rates uh, a bit better than, uh, than expected. So, uh, so that's a positive globally. And then uh, I think what we then saw toward the end of last year is a steeper than expected fall in inflation. And so I think that's led to a change in interest rate expectations. So uh, whereas th- th- there was a feeling that we might, might have to um, stay at quite high interest rate levels for quite a long time, I think now, and this is probably more the case overseas than it is in Australia, because w- again, we've lagged the process, but I think markets are, are starting to feel that there's rate cuts coming, that sort of not only are we at the peak, but we could see uh, interest rate cuts relatively quickly. And, and equity markets and bond markets have priced that in quite um, aggressively over the past few months. We've seen a big bounce in uh, in equities and a big uh, drop uh, in bond market yields coming off their October highs. And so I think um, that sets the scene for a better outlook for property as well. So we've been subject to the same forces this time last year. A lot of uncertainty as to how high interest rates were going to have to go and it just wasn't a very favourable outlook at all for investors. But I think now... You know, even though you know, we're still at this high level and we haven't um, de- beaten the inflation challenge uh, just yet in Australia, but I think there's a sense of a, of a more positive outlook and less uncertainty as we look ahead. Yeah, a huge impact on investors' cost of capital, the interest rates, uh, with that steep increase. Uh, the Fed's signalling probably a, a May cut, which is which is great news for the markets. When can we expect to see cuts in Australia, do you think? Well, I, I'm not, well, I'm not sure they're signalling just yet. I, I think they're... Um, the markets are certainly signalling that, and so so I think it's priced in. There's some pretty steep expectations that are um, implied through market pricing, which, uh, as you say, would imply you know, it was March, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Now it's probably more like May, um, and if anything, sooner uh, in Europe that we'll see some pretty s- significant reductions of the order of sort of 150 to 200 basis points over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. So you know, I, I wouldn't put too much stock on it being you know a particular month, but certainly the expectation is that we'll be uh, in the US and Europe we'll be starting to head down uh, pretty soon. I think in Australia then it's a bit more uncertain. So we didn't go up as quite as high in the first place. So having not gone pushed up interest rates quite as high, we're not going to then come off um, as much. And we we are on the path to lower inflation, but we've got a bit more to travel. So, but ha- you know, having said that, it's still the the most commentators think that really by the end of the year we should have seen uh, one or two interest rate cuts, and so again it won't be of the same quantum perhaps as we see as those other countries which have pushed rates so much higher. But 
again, it feeds into a more positive outlook for the market. Yeah, that positive outlook for the market, really important. And Justin, we've seen uh, transaction volumes across APAC have fallen 30% quarter on quarter. Um, th- there's still that bid-ask spread uh, in most markets. When do you think um, we'll see valuations come to a point where investors are comfortable getting back into the market in Australia? Yeah, it's a good, good question, Neil. I think uh, from an office point of view, there's been about 66% drop in volumes since um, 2022, I think it is, uh, in industrial and retail, probably in the mid-40% range drop in volume. So massive drop of transaction levels. Um, the valuation situation is very um, is still progressing. I think over the last 12 months, we've seen uh, valuers um, feel and see and hear the sentiment that's across the market. Uh, and valuers haven't adopted probably what that sentiment suggests with the massive rise in interest rates in relation to their, their book values. But I think with the advent of a number of transactions that have been uh, executed within the market more recently, that's when the valuers will really start to realise that these book values and their, their current valuation program will have to reflect the not just the sentiment but also the transactions that are going through. I think during 2023... Uh, there were very, very few transactions. And I think across the office sector, there was about $5 billion of transactions. And that's down um, from about a 18 to $20 billion per annum that we saw pre-COVID. Um, so I think now with transactions coming through, valuers have already started to soften the cap rates in some of these, these assets, not just office, but it's also across the sector. Uh, and I think that we're now coming into the March valuation Timing, uh, and definitely by June, I would expect to see valuations soften again. However, in saying that, there have been some outlier transactions that have proven that some assets have actually traded at book value uh, or even slightly above book value, um, which bucks the trend. And so it is very hard for a valuer at the moment to actually suggest that there's a a decrease of 10% or a 20% in value. Um, But I think the more transactions that happen during 2024, and we're starting to see them play out now, uh, I think that you'll see the valuations continue to drop. For me to put an actual uh, number on that or a discount or a um, um, 10 bips, 20 bips softening further, it's a pretty hard one for me to say. Um, but I think it's going to really be reflected on what the transactions happen over the next three to six months, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a huge amount of dry powder looking to get into the market. I mean, effectively, we've had almost 24 months of... Um, a big drop in transaction volumes, and so there, there's there's money ready to go. I think um, investors just waiting for a point where they they think that valuations aren't going to fall much further. Yep. Um, and I think we're pretty much there, uh, and we're also seeing um, a lot of the new economy sectors getting a, a, a strong amount of demand. Where are you seeing most demand coming from offshore investors at the moment? I look, there's no doubt that we still see strong capital coming from Asia, more so from Singapore and and, and Hong Kong to a degree. Um, that will continue, and it always Australia has always been um, a, a great um, destination for capital from Singapore because they do trust the country here and the dynamics of, of the different markets, and it's a very transparent market. Um, so definitely more interest from Singapore. Um, we have seen stronger interest from privates as well. I think this is the time when privates are at their best, when they've got limited competition from uh, domestic players such as the, the REITs, um, and we know that they're sitting dormant at the moment, and they're probably net sellers. So we expect to see more uplift from private capital, um, and potentially, potentially the US as well. Like we, we we understand obviously the market in the US is is quite depressed and quite dour, um, and that'll present opportunities for investors in their own market. Um, but we also feel that there'll be capital raised in those markets to deploy into. Strong, strong fundamental markets like Australian office um, and, and obviously logistics. And we also expect that there'll be more money coming into the retail sector as well. And I think one of the big um, moves of capital that we've seen over the last six months is Japanese capital um, um, be- because they also see that there's so much growth in Australia. Uh, and that capital is probably more focused on the living sector market, which is becoming uh, a much stronger sector in Australia. And it's, it's quite a mature market in, in areas like Japan, UK, Europe and US, and I think Australia is on the cusp of some pretty big um, uh, capital flows into those sectors. Yeah, yeah. Um, Japanese capital, definitely a, a massive mover. Um, the I think the 10-year average of outbound capital from Japan is about $1.5 billion. We've seen close to uh, $9 billion already um, 
in the last 12 months. Um, so a huge, huge expansion. We expect to see more of that. We're, we're getting a lot more inbound inquiry um, from pension funds, from developers, and as you say, into those new economy assets, um, particularly multifamily. And again, multifamily, huge increases. Uh, I think we've seen um, the full year investment into multifamily and APAC increasing by 50% on the on the 10 year average. So um, again, as that sector increases in Australia and we actually have the product to trade, I think we'll, we'll see a lot more activity in that sector. Um, and, and Ben, um, looking back at some of these past cycles, I, mean, I suppose you could say for the property market, this has been a bit like the GFC in terms of the, the drop in transaction volumes. Um, what do you think um, past cycles can teach us in terms of w- what we expect to see in, in the recovery in this cycle? Sure, I do think there are some echoes there. Um, each market cycle and different downturns we've been through are, are different. But um, and, and look, I think in the case of the GFC, we probably saw a steeper fall. Uh, but um, there was, if anything, there was a sort of a, a, a certain impetus for activity that carried on through that cycle because um, levels of debt and leverage were generally higher, and there was more of an, a need to trade. Whereas I think this time, reflecting the, the more conservative approach and more watchful eye that APRA and other regulators around the world have uh, have put on uh, the sector. That means people have been a bit more conservative, and so there hasn't been as much uh, as ma- as many of those um, uh, negative issues around debt, thankfully. But you know, re- regardless of that, and if we think look at past cycles, and even indeed if we look outside property, if we look at the equity market cycles we've been through. Um, it's, it's, there's a certain logic, obviously, that when some, when values are seen a significant fall, it tends to be a pretty good time to get in. And if you look at the, the turning point in terms of w- what is it that, that flicks the switch from uh, a market in a downturn to going back to a growth phase, it has a pretty strong correlation with the interest rate cycle, whether you look at the cash rate or whether you look at um, the bond yield cycle. And so if we think, you know, the, the, the general sense is that uh, overseas we're at the peak. The RBA has been a little bit more careful in, in its language, but certainly the expectation is in Australia we're at the peak now and that the uncertainty then isn't about, like, you know, when is the next, you know, will we see more int- rate increases? It's more about the timing and extent of, of cuts. And so I think that has an impact on the psychology of investors. We've seen that in markets like bond market and equity markets where we have daily pricing. We've seen that already. It takes a little bit longer to play out in property, but those past cycles would tell us that that now is a, is a very good time to be looking. And in yeah. 2024, this was the message we brought out in our, our Horizons report at the end of last year, that we think 24 will be a, a strong vintage. Um, certainly a lot better than the past uh, couple of years because investors will be getting in at a much more attractive entry point. They have stronger income returns and then they position themselves for capital growth. And I think past cycles have taught us that. Post-GFC, we saw that, that prolonged interest rate cutting cycle and prolonged yield compression and capital growth. Um, and I'd go back further than that, and I'd say in the second half of the 90s when we saw interest rates um, being cut, that was also a strong period of, of capital growth in, in, in the market. And so just as we see in other asset classes, um, you, if you get in at, at, a, at a lower price, a more attractive entry point, you set the scene for future returns. Yeah, excellent to hear that we'll, we'll, we should get those macroeconomic tailwinds coming into the market. Um, and in particular in the office sector, we've seen... Uh, yield expansion of you know probably 100 to 150 basis points uh, in some cases and we're certainly seeing a lot more investor demand um, for office assets now um, you know groups that we haven't really seen active for probably 10 or 15 years now inquiring on uh, on office buildings um, but obviously the there has been a structural shift in in the way people work and particularly um, that's impacted uh, US investors sentiment towards office quite negatively um, probably quite unfairly, I think, in, in APAC, um, the, the occupancy levels in, in the office sector are, are very strong, especially compared to, to US and Europe. Um, just in, in terms of the, the work from home scenario in Australia, um, are we seeing people coming back into the office a lot more? Yeah, we are, Neil. It's, um, I think your, your comment at the start of that question was about the US and the office market there, and it's a very different dynamic to what we see in Australia. I think I think uh, Australians like to go to work uh, and collaborate and integrate with with people in the office. Um, I can tell you, travelling around the country and into the different markets that we we have here in the different cities, um, Sydney is, and we're here today in Sydney, and it's hustle and bustle along, along Pitt Street and and so forth. Um, I see it in Brisbane. Um, speaking to a landlord recently, an institutional landlord, and they were telling us occupancy of their building was about eighty five percent, which is 
probably pre-COVID, it's probably a normal level. Um, I think a market like Melbourne is definitely one city that has suffered more greatly with the work from home um, theme and, you know, the, the lockdown that the people of Victoria went through was, was probably the major contributor to, to where Melbourne sits today. Um, but I think generally across the, the Australian landscape, I don't think the work from home theme is a big concern for people. Um, I think the biggest concern for investors is um, pricing, uh, cost of debt, um, and also the assets that are becoming, um, uh, or the, the secondary assets that need capital and refurbishment, they're the assets that probably need to, um, that will suffer greatly. But all, all in all, I think the core assets are the ones that will perform much greater. So there's definitely a stronger flight for quarterly for tenants. Uh, and I don't think the, the work from home theme will continue longer. And of course, there'll be some parts of the, the economy or the sector that will require people to work from home, like call centres. You don't need to be in the office to answer phones. So I don't think that's going to play a bigger part in the office market going forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly the, the cost of debt really is just hampering uh, hampering groups on, on what they can afford to pay for assets, particularly in the office sector. Uh, but generally, if you look at Asia Pacific as a whole, as to where investors can put their money, um, quite a lot of the US and European groups um, are shying away from China. And so that really only leaves uh, Australia, Singapore, um, and Japan really as the options um, and so I think we're, we're showing, um, seeing really good value in the office sector in Australia, and particularly with strong migration and some of the, the tailwinds that we're going to get from big infrastructure spends, such as in Brisbane, um, mm. you know, over the next 10 years. G- give us a flavour of what we can expect to see in the Brisbane market. Yeah, well, look, the Brisbane market's um, um, on the cusp of some massive growth. We already have seen that. There's a lack of supply, and, and for any investor in an office building supply and demand is really important. So in Brisbane, there's a there's three office buildings under construction, and and most of them are pre-committed or just about pre-committed. And what that's actually doing too is the cost of construction is pushing up the economic rents that make these developments feasible. Uh, so what we're finding around Brisbane is that some of the older assets or the B and A grade assets are benefiting from the higher rents that have been achieved in these new developments. So that is pushing up rents, and we're also seeing a decreased uh, cost of incentives. Uh, so the effective rent uh, that landlords will expect to get will actually increase quite cons- significantly. Uh, and then we've got the infrastructure boom that the state government and the private sector is undertaking. So we've got the Olympics in approximately eight years' time. And on the back of that, there's this so much growth of infrastructure across with the cross of a rail tunnel and the like of those type of projects and major upgrades to highways. And we've got the second runway now, which, which brings a massive capacity of planes coming in from all over the world. Um, so I think... Brisbane is now seen as probably the, the, the second destination for capital in Australia behind Sydney. Uh, it was always Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. I think both domestics and offshore groups are now saying that Brisbane is well and truly number two. Um, Sydney will always be Australia's gateway city. Um, Brisbane is maturing. Um, and, and, and unfortunately for Melbourne, with especially with the government um, policies that have been uh, deployed over the last couple of years, um, foreign investment in, in, in that market is making it harder. Um, Queensland's open for business. And I think with so much prospect of growth in that market, along with, the, as you said, Neil, the population growth, Queensland's always had a strong um, migration domestically. Um, and that's continued and it will continue. But we're also seeing massive numbers of foreigners coming into Queensland as opposed to going into New South, New South Wales or Victoria. Uh, so... I think Brisbane as a destination for capital, uh, for office, is um, is definitely the top of the picking, I think, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Ben, those migration figures uh, into Australia, um, we can expect to see them driving GDP to some extent. Um, give us a flavour for, for what you expect to be the, the main drivers of growth in Australia for the next kind of three to five years and how that will impact the property market. Sure, you, you've hit on population there, which is an important one. And coming back to the, the your, your question on the, on, the, on the outlook in terms of what's what's improved, I think one of the factors for Australia um, in terms of why growth has held up a little better than expected has been that really strong population growth. Um, that's hit sort of the sorts of growth rates of around 2.5%, which is way above um, historic trend, the strongest we've had in, in a very long time, I believe, since the early... Uh, since the early 70s, and, and obviously that is a direct, uh, providing a direct impact on, on demand in, in the residential sector. We see that very clearly. Uh, no doubt since you've been, you don't have to be 
um, all visitors from overseas would quickly notice all the, the coverage in the media around the lack of uh, rental accommodation. And so mo it's most obvious there, but it also impacts a demand base across other sectors, probably industrial and logistics is the next one that we see impacting. I think what we're hoping this year is that the, the growth story is less reliant on population growth and more reliant, on, you know, more broad based, if you like. So we've seen this period of um, households being put under a lot of pressure with high mortgage costs. Yeah, we're hoping that, uh, coming on, related to the, the point on interest rates, that that, that we gradually see uh, that 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 easing in the second half of, of the year, aided by some tax cuts that are coming. So we want to see a more broad base. Um, of growth, but look, generally in Australia we've got a you know, very diversified economy. We've got strong commodity industries, which which help help some parts of the market in Western Australia in in particular. Um, but that that underlying strength and the sort of things that attract investors to Australia are the sort of the things that that attract um, uh, immigrants to Australia. Our foreign students are an important part of that, and so. Uh, I think that's another important growth industry. So I wouldn't I wouldn't pin it on one. I'd say what we what we've seen at the, uh, over the past year is is a time when households have been under pressure and growth has been more reliant on immigration than normal. We want to see a more broad uh, broad base um, of economic. Uh, I won't say recovery because it's not, we, we haven't been through a, you know, sort of a downturn, but a more a more broad base of growth return. And I think that'll positively impact uh, demand across all sectors. Yeah. Very interesting. And the uh, the geopolitical situation at the moment is quite volatile with the Middle East and tensions over Taiwan. Uh, and that quite often results in uh, in money moving into more safe haven markets. And I think Australia can definitely be considered one of those markets um, And with the um, sectors such as the multifamily sector or living sectors growing quite substantially in Australia, um, giving investors that inflation linked return. Um, I think we'll see more money coming into those new economy sectors. Uh, th I think that's all we've got time for. So, Ben, Justin, thank you for joining me. Uh, and thank you for uh, our listeners for joining us for the Property Perspective. Any questions, please do get in contact with any of us. Thank you. Before you go, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on the next episode of The Property Perspective, when we'll be back to share our take on more key trends and topics shaping Australia's property market. You can also follow us on LinkedIn or visit our website at nightfrank.com.au for more information. Thanks for tuning in. It may be the end of the show, but we're always your partners in property.